Hi, everybody. Today's Pre-Accident Podcast is brought to you by Underwriters Laboratory, Worker Health and Safety. Now, they've got a new 11-module program, and the entire reason they're sponsoring the podcast is to introduce you to these modules. So the first title we're going to release is more informational for organizations, and it's really designed to help educate the entire population related to the new view of safety. So we get into looking at how the best-in-class organizations are utilizing these techniques to drive improvement but ultimately set up the rest of the content that will be coming online at the end of the first quarter. This first module will be available for free, and uh, we'll not soon when you're able to access that content as well as where. Thank you. All this at ulworkplace.com. Now, let's listen to the podcast. Yeah, I was trying to figure out where the hell I was going because the trail was marked by Cairns. Is that unusual in your life? Don't you spend most of your life trying to figure out where the hell you're going? Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm your host, Todd Conklin, and you're in for a treat today. Let's call today's theme um, this. Let's call it, there are no easy answers for difficult questions. Occam's razor might be wrong in the new view. Is that title too long? Maybe it is too long. I don't know. I was just playing around. I'm just woodshedding it right here. I don't know. We'll see what happens when I actually type this up on the deal, and then we'll have a pretty good understanding. It is the end of February. Yes, the shortest month is nearly over. Oh, my goodness. February is a really dominant month. Pretty much all inpatient mental health treatment is dictated by the fact that February is a, a short month. But, in fact, this year, don't we have Leap Year Day? Don't we have 29 days in February this year? I think we do. I think we have an extra day, so maybe this is a celebration of the leap year day that is in February, the 29th of February that's going to happen this year. This is the podcast, and it is going great. How's your year going so far? My big theme of slowing down, I'm not sure I'm doing very well at. I'm not taking enough time to smell the roses. I'm too busy, but I'm not complaining because that would be kind of creepy. And plus, you don't give a crap, so (laughs) it's any way around it is uh, where we are. I'm just trying to make it every single day. Thanks for listening. It is so nice to have you on board. And thanks for telling your friends. And keep listening because we're really working hard to get this news out and build this sense of community. We're all in this together, and we might as well enjoy the ride. That's what I'm thinking. Today's podcast features Bill Rigo. And Bill and I are going to talk about investigations. So there's been a lot of email traffic around doing more investigation podcasts. And I do have some people lined up that I think you'll enjoy immensely. I can't really talk about who they are, but they're big shot investigators who want to talk to us about investigation. But Bill and I have done a whole bunch, and um, we've done some together, actually, which is even better. And I just basically ask him, what is it we need to be thinking about and talking about when we do an investigation, when we do event learning? And he's going to dig into it, and he's going to talk about sort of why we do investigations, which I really think, as crazy as this sounds, is somewhat mysterious to companies. So you'll hear about that. You'll hear lots more as well. I hope everything's going great, and I hope you don't have to do very many investigations. But if you do, this podcast will really sort of set the stage. Now let me manage some expectations. It's not going to tell you how to do the investigation because it's not. It's just not going to do that. But we are going to talk about how to think about doing an investigation and how to sort of understand when you – have gotten to a point where your investigation is successful. And and oddly enough, the metric for a successful investigation is quite simple and easy to measure. And uh, we'll talk about that. Let's talk on the other side of this one because maybe there'll be more stuff to discuss. But right now, let's stick into this idea that there are no easy answers for hard questions. And let's do it with Bill Rigo as we talk about investigations. Here's Bill. There's been a lot of push to talk about investigations, and like I told you on the phone, I'm, I don't I don't think about them as a topic, and I should think of them as a topic. It's a really important topic. Yeah, well, you know, you know, you and I have done some, and and you know, most recently about a year ago. But I want to, I don't want to talk about that. But you know, your perspective 
which I agree with, is the goal of doing investigations is to learn and improve. And and I've thought about that a lot, and I I, I think it's you know I, I think it's good, and I like it. Um, and and I was thinking in terms of if I were a manager, what would I what else would I want to get out of this? And and I think, and this is just me. I, I think we want to move towards foresight. So we understand hindsight, you know, hindsight bias and confirmation bias and all that when we're doing, you know, old view investigations. But, it, but I think what managers are looking for desperately is some tool that will help them with foresight. And I think the new view, when coupled with investigations, will help them. You know, it's not a magic bullet, but it will help them get there. We ought to probably counteract when we say the goal of an investigation is to learn and improve. We probably ought to counteract that. I think traditionally what happens is leaders think the goal in the investigation is to avoid repeat occurrences, to determine facts and to establish liability. Right. I mean, that's the countervailing idea, I would guess. What do you think? Well, I agree with that. I think there's, you know, from my perspective, there's one thing that they tell me, and that's, well, I want to have corrective actions to prevent recurrence, which in the nuclear industry is really important. But but that's really the number two priority. The number one priority is to blame and punish someone other than me. And and when you confront managers with that, you know, they wince because you know that that's true. So as long as they can blame somebody, uh, they feel better. And, and we understand that as old view thinking, and Decker talks about it a lot. Um, so that's kind of what, what I think. It's you know corrective actions to prevent recurrence, but really to blame and punish somebody else. Other than me. Other than me, yeah. <laughs> wow. Other than me. Um, it, it, what's interesting is, is my history in the nuclear Navy is kind of contrary to that. And, you know, it, you know, I'm an old Rickover guy, and, and I interviewed with him, and, and that's another story that was not good. But um, people think that Rickover was into blame and punishment, and, and he really wasn't, uh, because what he insisted on his commanding officers was that when they called him and there had been some compromised reactor safety, the first thing they had to tell him was what they had done to contribute to that event. And if they blamed their crew members, Rickover would challenge them on it. And if they continued to blame their crew members, Rickover was on the phone shortly after that to find their replacement. And so he really believed in the leader of the organization taking responsibility for what happened. You know, and, and it was, you know, when the bad thing is happening, you're sitting in the critique, the leader has got to say, what did I do? to encourage, allow, or enable this thing to happen in the first place. And, and so that's my history, and that's how I think. And, but when I got into you know, the Department of Energy world, that was really contrary to what I saw, and it confused me. So what do you think about when you think about doing an investigation? Well, I, the, uh, what I think is, is that, I, first, I have to understand that the people who were there that triggered the accident or whatever it was didn't want that thing to happen, number one. Um, and, and number two, I, I've, you know, I've learned from you to ask how and not why. Because um, when, when you and I went through info training on causal analysis, you know, we were trained on five whys, and we nodded our heads and went, okay, that sounds good. But we, we ultimately learned that, that five whys is a pretty useless endeavor. Um, so asking how and not why. I, I know that timelines are important, but only from the start. Um, and so what's more important, and we've talked about this a lot in the past, is context of you know what's going on in the environment around the workers, you know, the decision makers, and then the mindset of that person who we think is making a decision, but when we look at it, you know, from Decker's tunnel is not a decision. Um, and so, you know, what, what I've done is to overlay context and the worker mindset uh, you know, over the timeline. And, and from that, 
some kind of a story emerges. And one of the things that I do, um, that I always do, and I learned this from uh, another one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Bill Corcoran, is to always do a 72-hour history of what was going on in the, you know, the, the person who touched it last, what was going on in their life prior to the time, you know, that they touched the company and the bad thing happened. And that really gets to worker mindset and what the context was at the time that they touched the company and the bad thing happened. Um, the other thing is, and, and you and I have found this over the years, is to get the workers who were there to be part of the investigation. And, you know, there's always a reason not to have a worker there because, you know, they do work and you don't want to pull them off the assembly line or you don't want to work, pull them out of the facility. Um, and the operations managers don't want them to be there. And, you know, so they send the supervisors and the, you know, and we talk to the supervisors and they go, well, you know, this is what happened. And we ask them, well, were you there? Is that what you saw? And they go, well, no, but that's what went on at the pre-job brief. Well, that's what the procedure said. So when we, when we actually talk to the frontline worker, generally a totally different picture emerges. So um, getting the frontline workers involved in the investigation is incredibly important. Uh, sitting down as a, as a group to talk through how things happened and how it occurred is, uh, is really important. And, and then, you know, what management is involved, you know, what they really want is, is solutions. And what I find is, 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 you know, people come into the investigation with solutions already in mind. Um, but you really need to defer that and, and treat that pretty harshly, uh, you know, to tell them to put that out of their minds until the story has been developed. But once the story is developed, I found that the solutions that emerge from the story come pretty naturally, and it's pretty easy for people to agree to them. Um, the other thing that I do in in developing solutions, you know, what, whatever you're going to, you know, once you come up with an explanation, is to provide a compelling story to management uh, at the end, is to not bound your solutions by cost or schedule. And that kind of frees their mindset, you know, to think, fairly creatively and ultimately the the solutions that generally emerge aren't very complicated or expensive um so the i i think the last thing that can come out of an investigation is um you know there's generally a taxonomy that you follow you know the company follows and for us in doe it was the it was the was the doe cat code you know the causal analysis tree and it's a very well-defined taxonomy, and, and I know uh, Exelon had a pretty good taxonomy. Um, but I, I tell the, the analysts and the people involved in it who are pretty familiar with the taxonomy, um, kind of hold off on that until the end. And then once you figure out, okay, well, here's how this happened, and here's what we think we're going to do with it, you know, then you can kind of shoehorn in what you found, the explanation, into the taxonomy. And the taxonomy is good for trending, and you know if epidemiologists want to take a look at it or statisticians, it, it can provide some uh, a, a good tool for them. I agree with you. I mean, I think you said a couple things. Well, I know you said a lot of brilliant stuff there, but one of the things I think is that I try to remember is that a good investigation writes its own corrective action. Yep. So the ho ho check, the the quality check that I usually think of when I do an investigation is not how well did we do or how accurate it is, or God forbid, is it factual? That's a whole other thing we should talk about. But in fact, did it lead us to corrective actions that actually make compelling sense for future state of work in the facility? And and what I find is that. Once you get the story down, you're right. I mean, the corrective actions are pretty much there. They're really obvious, and they're yeah. hardly ever expensive. Correct. Correct. I, I mean, sometimes they are, um, but but that's only when the the company has ignored, uh, you know, structural things for a long time. Um, and uh, but but one of the things that that I found interesting when I first started doing this. 
was this tension between old view thinking and new view thinking. You know, so when I first experienced this, um, it was in, it was in 1988, and I was uh, you know deputy facility manager in a in a plutonium facility, and we had a rad contact who was you know boogered up. Um, that's a technical term. Um, of course, we yeah. actually use the word crapped up, but I'm I know what you mean. Yeah, so we had this error monitoring equipment that was you know important to safety. And he, the guy failed to replace this planchette and the air monitoring equipment, and that produced a technical safety requirements or a TSR violation. So we're in fines and penalty stage. So, you know, we got to do a critique. And so because it was RADCON and because I had a special skill set, the facility manager, I, I was his deputy, said, you know, Rigo, you've got to be there for every one of these. So I went. But before the, the, the uh, critique... Um, he huddled with me and the shift manager who's the critique leader. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the rad contact is going to get 40 hours off without pay. We're going to add a new checklist and everybody, you know, it's going to be double signature and anybody who boogers that up, uh, we're going to fire them and we're going to do some training to brief the crew so they know what's going on. And, and I, and this is pretty normal. This is what the guy did. We wrote the corrective actions before we had the critique. And so I'm sitting in the back of the room with the DOE facility rep while the, you know, while the ship manager is going down the critique and leading to the, you know, the, you know, the conclusions that they'd already decided on. And the Rancon tech is sitting there, you know, in the wrong chair. And we've all seen these guys because it's the chair that all the other chairs are pointing his way and he knows he's going to get it. And, and I looked at him and I went, you know, I don't know you. I, I know everybody in this facility. How come I don't know you? And it turned out he was a subcontractor. And I went, you're not qualified to operate that continuous air monitor. That's not part of your contract. Your contract. That's not why we hired you. So why did you do it? And the guy stuttered and stammered. And it turned out he was in this room watching construction, which is what we pay him for. And one of the rad contacts who was not dressed out came by the door and asked him if he would mind doing it. And so because the guy was on a six month, you know, he was kind of temporary. But if we gave him a good recommendation, we'd hire him permanently and he wanted to be considered to be a team player. He went ahead and did it and didn't understand how it worked. And and so immediately I realized this wasn't about this rad contact. This was how we engaged with work in the facility. And it, it turned out, you know, punishing the guy, putting a checklist, none of those corrective actions would have helped this thing. And it turns out we had a problem with supervision and the rad con supervisor for that shift actually had no idea what was going on in the shift. And, and so the rest of the story is, is that three years later, we had another incident where workers were falsifying dosimetry records uh, in high radiation areas, and this was the supervisor that basically was encouraging them to do it. And we ultimately fired him. Um, and, and so, you know, that was an organizational problem that we recognized early on but didn't do anything about. And why didn't you do anything? Is it because the, the management didn't want to hear what you had to say, or were you not, not able to say it? It, it didn't occur to us. You know, we just thought, okay, well, we'll just carry this guy along. And our assumption was the RADCOM manager would counsel him and do all this other stuff. But in our, you know, this is, you know, South Carolina, it's the South. So we, we you know, we try to be nice. Well, and, and I would say there's a couple things about that that are worth pulling out. One is that your intention was right and your desire was true. Yep. It's not that you were being evil geniuses, you really thought 40 hours without pay and a new checklist and new training made sense to you, right? I mean, it seemed like a, a reasonable corrective action. And this is in 1988 before I'd read Decker or, you know, before we had even met. I was, and, I wasn't even born, Bill. Oh, stop it. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> well, and I, but I think this is really, when people ask to talk about investigations, I don't know. I, I should pick your brand in this. I, I think I always kind of fall into this trap that 
they want us to help them sort of tell them how to do an investigation. Right. And I don't really know. I don't know how to do an investigation because they're always different. What I think is important is, is that you, uh, you talk about how to think about doing the investigation and it's really sort of bringing in the fact that what you want to do is ultimately explain how the event happened. And then mm-hmm. once to your satisfaction that you can sort of explain how the event happened, then you go through and look for areas that you think um, would really benefit from something new, something different, uh, to to be completed in a different way. Fair enough? Yeah, I agree. Um, and so I had another event uh, that this occurred in 2008. So this is after I met you. This is after I read Decker. Um, and I'd read Holnagel and, and had done a number of investigations that the company struggled to, to say that they liked them. Yeah, and this is, again, this conflict between new view and old view. So I was clearly in the new view camp, but, but we had a, in our solid waste project, uh, we'd had our fourth TSR violation in a year. We were definitely in fines and penalty spaces. And the project manager wanted to fire the operator who had who had caused this accident, but the company president realized yeah, there's something else going on here that I'm not getting from the project manager, and so he he sent me in to do an independent look. So I showed up at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning to interview the operator, and I had him just kind of walk me through it. And there's nobody around. I mean, on a Sunday morning, and it turned out the guy was really competent. He had a four-year degree in biology. He was operating a mass spectrometer to determine the amount of hydrogen in the headspace of a low-level waste drum. And he made a mistake, and you know the the drum was positive according you know to um, you know the fire protection uh, safety rules. And he had to put it in this different array, a suspect array, and he he put it in the wrong array. And that was the mistake, and that led to the TSR violation. And it was the fourth time that this had happened. So when I was doing the 72-hour timeline on his life, I, you know, what was going on? You know, I said, you know, did you get a normal night's sleep, you know, the night before? And it was like day one of days. And he, he said, well, not really, because my wife and I had had this difficult conversation. Weren't you curious, because that event had happened four times, that there was some sort of significant weakness in you know, the process was overly complex or difficult to oh, yeah. understand. Yeah, and, and so the rest of the story is, is I spent a lot of time with engineering and operations looking at the procedures, and it turns out the, the procedures had, had lots of fluidity and, and room for interpretation by the operators, and they were counting on the, the pretty really skilled operators to figure it out. So what, what, in your opinion, are the most important things – a person should be thinking about or knowing as they go into any kind of event review, event learning, or investigation? How do you sort of set up to do one? Well, I read everything I can about it, but but I go in... It's funny funny you'd say that, and I hate to interrupt, but no, actually, I love to interrupt. Is You know, I do exactly the opposite. I don't read anything. Yeah. Well, I'm an engineer. What what can I do? (laughs) But but I, I try to understand... Just from a you know drawings and you know what it's supposed to be doing, I, I try to get an idea of physically how does it work. Um, but I, I then set that aside and I I go okay I know nothing, and I walk in and I just let the story emerge. And it, it's so it's kind of like reading uh, Tony Hillerman, you know for for those of your listeners who. Uh, haven't read Hillerman, they should. Yeah, they all but, should, for sure. But there's a, you know, the legendary Joe Leaphorn, Lieutenant Leaphorn is the protagonist in, in the Hillerman series, and he's this Navajo cop. And he's got a young sergeant, Jim Chi, that, that he's trying to bring up. And so they walk in on a murder scene, and, and Sergeant Chi talks to the legendary Joe Leaphorn, and he goes, what should, be, what should we be looking for? And Leaphorn goes... I don't know. Look for everything. And I, so I've kind of taken that on as my mantra when I go into, you know, in an investigation, I start by assuming nothing. But how, how do you everything. do that? Because once you've read everything, 
aren't you just going to be sort of biased? I mean, it has to bias you. You know stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But I, but I've learned how to um, how to really compartmentalize that, and, and and it helps me understand kind of what's going on. But it it also, you know, I don't have to ask any more technical questions. So I'm just focused on, you know, what happened. So so I'm one of these people, you know, since I am an engineer, I, I kind of need to know that first. Now, for you, um, you know, as a, you know, as a psychologist. Um, non-engineer, you know, as a non-engineer. Yeah, you don't need to know that. Um, and, and, you know, and if you if you looked at it, it would. You know, it, you're pretty bright. I mean, no, it would screw me up. I'd be like, "Oh, look at that!" Yeah. So, but but I can pick up these things pretty easily, and <laughs> and it doesn't. It really doesn't get in my way, and it allows me to, you know, when I see something technically that I don't understand, um, I, it I don't have to stop and figure it out because I'm much more inclined to stop and try to figure out technical things than you are, and but I think it depends on on what's going on. So for example, when, you know, when you and I pair on an investigation, you know, you've got all the non-technical stuff. I've got the technical stuff, but we, we also have a good cross understanding of both the technical and the non-technical skills. So we complement each, each other really well. Um, and what I find with investigation teams is, you know, I, I try to put people on them, who are, you know, buttheads or very quiet people or very uh, analytical people, you know, to get a good diverse mix of, of thought processes on the investigation team. Uh, and, and that diversity of thought and experience, I, I think, really helps. Um, be, and, and that results in a lot of conflict on the team initially. How important is that conflict, in your opinion? It's essential. I agree. I think a good investigation, probably I'd have an argument in it at some point. Oh, yeah. And if it doesn't happen, I, I try to start one. <laughs> and, you, and you do, too. <laughs> Oops. Oh, that was a secret. Sorry. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's, again, you got to have a timeline. Although what I've found over the years is, 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 the timeline becomes increasingly unimportant the more you learn about the context and the mindset of the people that were involved in it. Um, but that's kind of where you start. And that's typically when you're coming in on a big, on a big investigation, the timeline is generally already developed. Um, so you might as well just start with that. Um, but boy, you know, that context thing, you know, as, as Shane Bush will tell you, context is, is important. What about uh, facts? Well, I remember the colloquium that Decker led at Los Alamos several years ago, and people asked that question, and, and or somebody asked that question, and and, he, and so he asked them back, "What's a fact?" And he's and and the person said, "Well, it's things that you believe to be true," and he goes, "What's truth?" And well, truth is based on facts. So it, it he pointed out that it's circular circular logic, and so you, so. Facts are, are pesky things, but you have to determine the fidelity of those facts. And they're negotiable. Facts are negotiable based upon perspective. So the world looks different for a leader than it does for a worker, and it should and therefore always will. By definition, they have different perspectives. Fair enough? I agree. And so facts are, may not be facts. You know, So like the when you're talking to a supervisor and you ask him, well, did the worker do this or did the worker do that? And they'll go, well, the worker did this because that's what was briefed at the pre-job brief. But when you talk to the worker, the worker did something else. Why is there a need to simplify? When we investigate, there's a really, there's, there's almost, or traditionally there's been a need to simplify, to remove the complications and complexities that exist in real operations and to simplify them in the investigation, which I think really harms us. But why do you think that exists? Well, it's because we like to think linearly. So if you're on a linear path, and I mean that in a bad way, <clears throat> um, if you're on a linear path, 
you can exclude all this complexity. Um, but, but one of the things that Admiral Rickover used to say was that there are no easy answers to hard problems. And so if you're, and people seek easy answers, you know, they want the one thing that they can do. Um, the reality is, is that if you've got a very complex problem, uh, you know, in the, in, with these socio-technical issues, you're, you're probably not going to have these easy answers. Um, and so you should just dispel that. But culturally, you know, managers really want to have a simple story that they can go from point A to point D with everything in between in a straight line that they can understand. And it, it's hard to, to tell them, except in a narrative form, um, kind of what the complexity of what's involved. So it's like the, you know, the guy that you interviewed um, in the podcast last week on the, the diver safety. Right. So he's, he's struggling because there's no taxonomy, number one. But what he did say was where he gets the most important information is from the narratives. And the narratives is where the complexity is. Yeah. I think you may have hit it on the head. There are no easy answers to hard problems. Yeah. <laughs> so in many ways, what the investigation does is try to give a complete explanation for a complex problem, a hard problem. Yeah. 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 And that's how you know you're done. Well, uh, I'm not sure you know that you're done. <laughs> I agree. And, but but as Corcoran says, you know, the the investigation is over when you run out of time and money. So, because it's a project, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end is the story. You know, the, the end used to be, well, here are the causal factors. Here's what caused it. And here's the corrective actions to prevent recurrence. What we found is, is that, the story is the end point. So if you're satisfied with the story, then management can take that and move along. But, but one of the things that I've begun to think about hard over the past several months is um, not just that we're learning and improving, but that we're learning enough and we're improving enough and we're engaging enough with our workforce that we can generate some kind of foresight or the ability to kind of peek around corners. And, you know, we've done these exercises, you know, we'll, we'll do some training and, and we'll ask the group to write down, where do you think the next accident's going to occur? And so we're kind of crowdsourcing knowledge. And amazingly enough, the workers, the frontline workers, when they tell you, hey, here's where we think the next problem is going to be, management is generally unaware of that. So they go and look and they find, holy crap, you know, there's all kinds of problems here. And, and what they're doing is they are, in fact, developing foresight. So they're looking at, at where the potential accidents could happen before they happen, and they're, and they're agreeing with the workforce, and then they're going and, and doing something about it. Um, but you've got to have that collaboration between or engagement between the workforce and, and management um, the other thing that we often ignore is the collaboration with the technical folks. So I view it as kind of a three-way collaboration or engagement between management, frontline workers, and technical, who's generally engineering or, or what have you. And in the Navy, when we were trying to develop good procedures for nuclear reactors you know, back in the 50s, um, that's what Rick over finally came to was you got to sit down with the operators, the procedure writers and the engineers to write a procedure that would actually work. Um, and, and that again, I think develops foresight. So, you know, the, the big message for me, kind of where I'm going is how do you develop foresight from things that happened in the past? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? That's such a cute little check in there, Bill. Thank you. So there you have it. That was the discussion on, uh, I think it's really probably the first of many discussions on investigations because they're really important. And it's tough because we want to make them super linear and we want to make them super simplified and we want them to be clear fact-based sort of evidential 
descriptions of what happened, and they're just not. I mean, events don't fall into that category, especially holistic, complex events, the kind that we deal with. And so you start talking about awesome post postmortems, as the DevOps people talk about, or or event learning, or learning teams. All these things are ways to really leverage information. I thought this was remarkable. I love the idea of a menage a trois. Uh, kind of an orgy of information, if if I may use those illusions. You've got management, you've got operations, and you've got engineering. And all three have to have a voice at the table because that's how we describe how failure happens. That, my friends, is the podcast. I hope you loved it. Uh, it again, it's the beginning of this discussion, but I think we probably can't spend enough time talking about investigations, that's for sure. Um, I hope you had fun. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends. Let's try to get those numbers up because it matters now. And subscribe. And any comments or suggestions or volunteers that want to feature themselves on the podcast, you know you're welcome. Just give me a ring, and I'm glad to hook it up, brother. I can make it happen. Until then, learn something new every single day. Bet you did today. Have as much fun as you can, and for goodness sakes, be safe. But it's, it's messy. Uh, it's, it's complex. It's intangible. It's,